Hello and welcome to the Alatia Foundation podcast. My name is Naweed Jabarkil. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Mr. Fatih Birov, the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. During his nine-year tenure in charge of the IEA, Dr. Birov has taken a series of steps to modernize the Paris-based organization, including strengthening ties with economies like India and China. He's also stepped up work on the clean energy transition as global efforts to reach net zero emissions have accelerated in recent years, raising questions about the role of fossil fuels, which is where the IEA's traditional focus has been. Dr. Fatih Birol, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Dr. Birol, as executive director of the IEA, a lot of your work is of a political nature, given the global role the organization has in your member states, as well as how prevalent energy has been in the global conversation recently. I want to start away from that world, though. Just give us a sense of what your typical day in the office looks like. A typical day uh, for work starts for me at around six o'clock in the morning at home, uh, between six and seven thirty. I try to reply the emails uh, I receive uh, overnight and prepare my day, my speeches, uh, uh, my uh, comments and the drafts of reports my colleagues prepare. And I come to work around uh, uh, nine o'clock and uh, have meetings with my uh, colleagues, learn from them, share my thoughts and uh, my vision uh, with them and uh, lots of uh, uh, visitors and meetings uh, I have throughout the day, uh, but I have to tell you that uh, almost every second day in a year I uh, spend traveling uh, around the world. A busy schedule, yeah. We appreciate the the time you've given up for for this today. Uh, let's look at the the world of energy. Then, in the past, some energy companies within uh, your member countries may have viewed oil producers as the opposition. With that in mind, how would you describe the current relationship between the IEA and major oil producers? I think this is uh, 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 it is very good dialogue between the uh, many oil producers. And having said that, within the IEA member governments of the IEA family, there are major oil producers as well. United States, uh, Canada, uh, Norway, uh, Brazil, Australia, Mexico, they are all uh, uh, members of the uh, IEA, and uh, not only we have many members, but we also work very closely with the several uh, oil uh, producers. I just came from, in fact, from Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, where I was. Uh, rec- I recently received the award uh, last week from uh, the. Uh, Highness His Highness uh, Bin Zayed, uh, Mohammed Bin Zayed, the president. Or tomorrow, I am receiving the Iraqi oil minister at IEA in my uh, office, the His Excellency Abdul Ghani. So we work very closely with the oil producer countries, uh, uh, but we also say, producers and consumers, what we think uh, the challenges and the opportunities are there uh, for them in the next years to come. Uh, and we have uh, no a uh, uh, way that we are uh, shy of saying what we think as we read the data because we are an evidence-based organization and uh, no fear no favor if i have to make a small uh, uh, summary here and let's talk about what what it is that the iea thinks because when it comes to the energy transition and climate change in particular in recent years uh, that has gained attention it's been interpreted by some energy firms some analysts as anti fossil fuels do you think that's fair and has that stance changed yeah no i think we we look at all fuels and all technologies we are not biased on this fuel with the other fuel but I should also tell you that we have a major challenge, all of us in Middle East, in Africa, Europe, United States, uh, Canada, I don't know, Asia, which is climate change. And about uh, 80% of the emissions causing climate change uh, comes from the energy sector by using uh, uh, fossil fuels. And it is the reason uh, we believe there is a need to reduce the emissions if we want to have a planet in the future, which is more or less uh, like uh, today. And uh, uh, one way of addressing this is to reduce the 
use of uh, fossil fuels, starting with coal, but uh, also other uh, fossil fuels. This doesn't mean that from one day to another, uh, tomorrow, we will not need uh, fossil fuels, but the, the share of fossil fuels need to decline if we want to have a, a planet uh, more or less uh, like today in the future. But if we don't have a, such a, a, a concern, if we are uh, ready to have a, a world uh, where we are faced with the catastrophic implications of climate change, like floods, like the, the heat waves and the others, so uh, we may well go with the current uh, fossil fuel-based energy system, which I believe is not a good news for anybody, producer or consumers alike. And, and that uh, concern that, that you have, you touched upon there, the official IEA position on climate change, that's something that's uh, faced uh, and gathered some attention, particularly the idea that it may be politicised or too much in favour of those who are um, calling for change and advocating for change on climate change. Uh, just to clarify then, state the official IEA position and why we need the energy transition. Sure, our IEA's position is very clear. Uh, it is... We want to have a, a, a sustainable and secure energy future, which in turn means that the uh, global emissions need to decline fast and faster than uh, 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 the uh, current trends are. And in fact, in the United Arab Emirates, in the COP28 in uh, 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 Dubai, uh, all the countries, including the producing countries, signed and uh, agreement uh, that they want to move away from uh, fossil uh, fuels. Of course, we want to see this moving away being a fair and in an orderly manner. And as an organization, the IEA traditionally dedicated to maintaining a steady supply of oil throughout the world, its formation just after the oil crisis in the 70s. Has that changed now to a broader outlook on energy, given what you've just been describing? And why is that significant? So energy security is our core uh, mandate. It, it can be oil, it can be gas. For example, in terms of uh, uh, oil, uh, in the last uh, years, we uh, were uh, able to bring a substantial amount to, of oil to the markets from our uh, uh, oil stocks in order to address the, uh, the challenges that the oil markets uh, were facing because of different political uh, uh, reasons. And at the same time, uh, in, in terms of uh, natural gas, uh, after the Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine, uh, when the Russian gas exports to Europe was cut, we came up with a 10-point plan how Europe can uh, survive without uh, receiving substantial amount of gas imports from uh, Russia. But there are some other, uh, in addition to oil and gas security concerns, which are still uh, very close to our heart, uh, there are some uh, emerging energy security issues, such as the critical minerals. It is a new area that the IEA is uh, working and our ministers uh, gave us as a mandate, in addition to oil and gas, look after the critical minerals uh, security as well. So the energy security is changing, definition 21st century. We are uh, uh, paying attention both to traditional energy security challenges, oil and gas, as well as the new ones such as uh, critical uh, minerals. And on critical minerals, the first uh, report outlook from the IEA uh, last year in the middle of 2023, showing how importantly you take that. Demand set to rise rapidly, you say, um, but investment in critical minerals and securing those supply chains not really matching that. Uh, just how far off are we and what could that mean, do you think, if, if, if there is that mismatch moving forward? You are completely right. We were the first one who put on the table uh, the very challenge that the while we see a huge amount of uh, solar power, wind power, electric cars and the others coming to market, they may not need uh, oil or gas or coal, but they need critical uh, minerals. And uh, until recently, there was not enough attention paid to critical uh, minerals and not enough investment uh, went there, in terms, especially in the mining uh, sector. And there is a, a looming gap between the growing demand as a result of fast clean energy transition 
and the uh, supply. And uh, I believe that this uh, attention is now uh, uh, growing and critical minerals investment uh, uh, in many parts of the world. And uh, we are in a better shape, but still, I believe uh, big challenges uh, for not having the enough investments in uh, critical uh, minerals uh, mining and processing. This is one. Second, the critical minerals uh, uh, refining is uh, focusing on a one or two countries rather than being diverse. So, the in my view, the energy security challenges. It can be oil, gas, critical minerals. There is one magic, magic word, which is diversification. And I hope we can have diversification for critical minerals as well, both in terms of mining, but in terms of uh, refining and processing as well. And two countries at the center of whether it comes to critical minerals or energy moving forward, uh, China and India reports suggest when you uh, read around the IEA attempting to build further links with those major yeah. energy users and in the future with clean technology producers as well. As those links build, uh, do you think the nature of the IEA may change given that member states are already concerned about what's to come? So uh, you may or you may not know, but when I became the head of the IEA in the year 2015, one of the first things I have done was opening the doors of the IEA to emerging world. Until 2015, IEA family, IEA membership was limited to the OECD members, Western countries. But uh, since uh, then, we have uh, uh, 14, 15 countries joined the IEA as member or associate member. They range from Mexico to uh, Brazil, from Brazil to China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, Kenya, Senegal. It is, uh, I believe, it is the only way to address this global energy uh, issue. Uh, we need to have both uh, major uh, consumers of today, consumers of uh, tomorrow, and also having a, a good dialogue with the oil and gas exporting uh, countries. If we want to have a future, uh, energy future, which is secure, uh, which is sustainable, and provide peace and prosperity uh, to the entire world. I think this is the only way uh, we can uh, go forward. And thanks to that expansion of the membership, your member countries now in the IEA uh, constituting approximately 80% of the total energy demand worldwide. How does, uh, I wonder, that substantial influence translate into shaping national policies, given how difficult we've seen it in processes like COP to actually change national behavior. Um, just how substantial is that influence when it comes to telling countries what to do, essentially? Yeah, so COP28, in my view, was a, a landmark uh, 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 meeting. It, it uh, provided a major uh, outcome document, which put a vision uh, for the entire energy world. It took place in the, as I mentioned, in, uh, in United Arab Emirates, and as I said uh, last week, I was there uh, having a meeting with the um, uh, uh, His Highness uh, Mohammed bin uh, Zayed and uh, other officials. And I congratulated them once again to be able to come up uh, with uh, such a, a vision for a roadmap for the world. Uh, and some of the important outcomes for the energy sector are the ones we have been suggesting uh, well before the uh, uh, the uh, uh, meeting taking place in uh, Dubai, such as tripling the renewable capacity between now and 2030, doubling the energy efficiency improvement, reducing the methane emissions substantially, and also uh, providing uh, support investment for clean energy in emerging and developing countries. I believe uh, this was a confirmation of where the world energy system is uh, going. The only question is there is that the, there is a clean energy transition happening. What is the uh, pace of this transition? The destination is clear, but the pace will be depending on uh, what uh, the what kind of policies the governments uh, are going to take in response to the COP28 outcome, which more than 200 countries uh, signed off and committed themselves. And just lastly, then, to finish off, Dr. Birol, the international multilateral landscape becoming more challenging. 
One question that, that, that I'd be keen to get your thoughts on is as the energy transition proceeds, what technologies will become the most important, do you think, for your member countries? Yeah, I think our member countries, the IEA, when you look at the International Energy Agency family member countries, we uh, constitute about 80% of the uh, global energy use. We work with them, uh, we share our views, we get their views uh, back. Uh, when I uh, look at it, uh, I believe the solar, wind, uh, and hydropower will be very important. And if I can give you one example, last year, of all the power plants built in the world, the new power plants built in the world, uh, about 85% were uh, uh, renewables. And uh, this will be a big part of the electricity generation, but I expect the, also the electric cars uh, are going to grow uh, strongly. Uh, only uh, three years ago, one out of 25 cars sold in the world was electric. And this year we expect uh, uh, one out of five cars sold will be electric. Uh, together with this, I expect the hydrogen will play an important role. And uh, I see around the uh, world that there is a comeback of uh, nuclear power. Uh, these uh, technologies uh, will be important, but once again, this doesn't mean that tomorrow we will not need any more oil, we will not need any more gas, but if the world, uh, our world reaches our international uh, uh, energy and climate goals, the use of uh, oil and gas needs to go down or through different technologies, the emissions uh, from producing and consuming of uh, uh, fossil fuels need to go down significantly. So we have to make a choice uh, between the our uh, energy choices and the uh, future of uh, our uh, planet. And I am sure that the, all the countries around the world uh, would like to see a world which is a secure, sustainable, and a peaceful uh, one. And the way go through that is to work uh, together and having a good dialogue between producers and consumers and south and the north of this uh, world. An optimistic note then to finish on, and thanks for touching on all those uh, different parts of the energy mix and what could be important moving forward. Dr. Fatih Birol, that concludes today's interview. Thank you for providing us with your expertise on the state of the energy transition and some frank and great insights into the work of the IEA, the foundation. Very much looks forward to speaking with you again in the future. And of course, as always, thank you for listening. Be sure to keep up to date with all of the Alatia Foundation's work by following us on X, previously known as Twitter and YouTube. You can find us under our name.